introduction. Hello, everybody. A happy Sabbath to all of you here. Is this a, is this a new COVID record right here as far as a gathering for us? I think it is. And I want to welcome everybody who's listening online, live or later. Um, and I want to, before we begin, not only thank those who you've already seen up here. You've seen people up here uh, playing instruments, singing songs, uh, giving an offering call that was quite unique. Never heard a piano broken down that way. Uh, an excellent children's story, but there are people you don't see that have made this happen. Setting things up, making sure the speakers and microphones work and the slides are there and they're changing and all of that. So thank you, everybody. Would you like to thank those people too? Yeah. Why don't you do that? Now, Lauren already made mention of the newsletter. And since both he and I know that it often doesn't get read, then I'm going to invoke the e-newsletter now and share what I shared in my devotional there by telling a story. Can you all tolerate a few more stories today? Yes? Um, I started in the newsletter by asking if you ever had an unusual experience with a medical professional. And... And then I told a story in there about a woman who went to get relief from this problem she had. She had tried to overcome it on her own in a myriad of ways, and nothing was helping, so she decided to finally go visit her doctor. Well, her doctor happened to be on vacation, so she saw this new young doctor. In fact, he was a fairly new doctor as well. And she saw him, and after spending only about four minutes in the, in the exam room, she burst out, screaming. I mean, she was just beside herself, running down the hall. Well, an older doctor happened to be there, and he was a colleague of her doctor, and, and she, he caught her and said, oh, excuse me a moment, Let, let's go to my office, and somehow was able to bring her to his office where he asked her to tell him what was behind this hysteria. After listening to her tell what she had come in for, and what this new doctor had told her, he said, look, why don't you just sit here in my office, try to relax, I need to go talk to that man. And that older doctor very angrily marched down the hallway to where that younger doctor was, pulled him aside, and said, what on earth is the matter with you? Mrs. Terry is 63 years old. She has four children and seven grandchildren, and you tell her she's pregnant? The younger doctor never looked up from the paper in the clipboard at his hands. He just said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, that is exactly what I told her. But I bet her chronic hiccups are gone. <laughs> creative medicine, huh? Would you call that creative medicine? The Bible doesn't tell us the specific types of treatment that this particular lady was recommended to by her doctors. But it does tell us about this woman who went to many doctors, and yet she still experienced a dozen years, a dozen years of a malady, of chronic bleeding. And I'll leave it to your adult imaginations as to what was going on there. You could probably guess quite accurately. But it also tells us, as some, many of you recall, that the master physician, the last physician she saw, Jesus himself, did actually heal her of her chronic illness. But the thoughts of that, or the, the circumstances around that, that healing, I think are very much worth pondering. The story, if you're interested, those of you online, those of you here, you could find it in Matthew 9, you could find it in Luke uh, 8, but we're going to look at Mark chapter 4 in just a little bit. I want to say this. It was all, this story is also what Elder Bing, our Washington Conference president, used last week as the springboard for his sermon. Let me make it clear. Going over the same story, the same Bible story, as was told last week, 
should not be seen in any way, shape, or form as casting a shadow on last week's sermon. Instead, I think it should help us to see the riches that are in the very storied minds of Scripture that contain an endless supply of lessons for us. And I think we would do ourselves well to be eager to yet find more and more and more in stories that we maybe have heard a myriad of times. A wise older pastor, when I was first a pastoral intern down in Sacramento, California, just a total newbie to this thing, didn't see it coming. I did not, I was never on a quest to be a pastor. I did not see that coming, and my wife didn't think she was going to be a pastor's wife either. So when that church asked me, would I be a pastor there, I had to call my fiance, now my wife, and say, hey, uh, we need to pray about something. But there I was as an intern needing to learn a lot of things about pastoring. And there was this older pastor there. He was well into his 70s at least. And we had several conversations. And one of them, he said to me, Michael, always remember that no Bible study is ever finished, only abandoned. Think about that. No Bible study is ever finished, only abandoned. At some point, you have to do other things. And so you lay that aside and you go do other things because... That's, those things are important too. But never have we exhausted, I believe, any story in the Bible. I don't know if we've exhausted any verse in the Bible. So here we are covering this story again because after reading the story of Jesus healing this bleeding woman before last week's sermon and going over it again this week, um, I just want to delve into it further and I hope that you will agree with me that it's worth the effort. With that all said, let's pause and let God know that we want him to be with us again, shall we? Father, again, we come before you and we say thank you for being with us. I hope you have delighted in the story that has been told, the songs that have been sung, the music that's been played, the calling upon us for us to give back to you a portion of the riches you've given us, all for the honor of your Son. And now, Lord, we want you to know that we desire for your angels to be here, for them to help us cut out anything that would hinder us from hearing your voice through a man's voice. You can do that, Lord. No voice is as worthy of hearing as yours. So once again, through the what Paul calls the foolishness of preaching, may you, God, speak to all of us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, um, many of us are into chronology. We, we understand things in a time sequence a little better than otherwise. So let's go over the sequence of events as told in Mark. If you're relatively new to the Bible, you will notice that one Bible storyteller tells things in a different order than another. You won't see the same, same sequence in Matthew or in Luke or in Mark or John. It, it doesn't mean the Bible's bunk. To me, it gives the Bible more validity. Because if it was all planned out and choreographed, it probably would flow more seamlessly. But it's left the way it is. And we in the 21st century wrestle with that a little bit, but in the ancient Hebrew times, no. Because the most important thing to telling a story was to tell it in such a fashion, in such an order, that the main point gets across. Not the time chronology that we can be obsessed with in our time-centered 21st century America. So don't let that disturb you. But we're going to focus on the the sequence of events as they are told in Mark that cover about a three-day period of time. So first we have this, Jesus heals this man with a withered hand in a synagogue on the Sabbath, no less, and he takes a lot of heat from it. It probably happened in Capernaum, uh, which is at the north or northwest, we, would, we like that, we're from the northwest, right? So it happens in the northwest portion of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus knows that the Pharisees are now plotting his demise. He takes a little saunter over to the Sea of Galilee, where a great multitude, the Bible says, quote unquote, a great multitude follows him there. Some are local, others have come from far away. All directions of the compass, north, south, east, west. Some have come from Tyre and Sidon in the north. 
Some have come from Jerusalem, 85 miles to the south. Some have come from Idumea, this region even below Judea, probably about 130 to 150 miles. Think of it. Would you take a trip to see somebody by walking if you had to come here to Puyallup from, say, Bellingham or Portland? That's about what this was like. So his popularity in this particular year is, is really high. These people have come. Jesus takes time to select 12 disciples. Later on, he goes to, according to Mark, he goes to Matthew's house. He goes to Matthew's house and he speaks there. And while he's there, because of the things he's saying, Mark tells us that people thought he was out of his mind. His family thought he was out of his mind. His mother and his brothers are there and they tell people, hey, can you go inside and tell Jesus that we're out here, we're waiting for him? They wanted to take him away because they thought he was losing it. Sounds weird, huh? This is the Son of God right here. But that does sound strange to us. Admit the Bible sounds strange to us. But Jesus makes this statement. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Remember that statement. It comes to light later on. Whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sister. So Jesus gives this sermon by the sea to an even larger crowd. Mark says it's a very great multitude. He had described a great multitude at first. Now it's a very great multitude. In the evening, Jesus leaves the crowd and he says to his disciples, hey, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. And so they do. A fierce storm rises during this trip, maybe five or six miles. And while the storm rises and the disciples are afraid for their lives. They think they're going to die. Jesus is sleeping. And they go and wake him up. And he gets up and he speaks to the storm the way a good parent would speak to an unruly child. He simply says, quiet, still. And it happens. The waves subside. The thunder and lightning vanish. There's a calm. Well, sort of a calm. Because Mark tells us The disciples became very much afraid. This is after the storm. They were afraid. Now they're very much afraid. And again, bookmark this. They say, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this man is the question. And that question ties the miracle of the calming of the sea to the next three miracles that Mark tells us about. So I want to go to the next slide. In the past, in, in this short span of time, this short span of time and space, there are four miracles. We've just covered one of them in this, in this part. Three people that wind up at Jesus' feet, and there are storms, and there is peace giving. Troubled waters, troubled minds, troubled bodies, and Jesus brings peace to all. The disciples are afraid of Jesus. He brought peace to the lake, and yet they were prompted to fear. He would spend his life trying to give them peace. Demons and townspeople are afraid of Jesus. He cast a demon or demons out of a person possessed, and they went into pigs who went off a cliff, and the townspeople said, um... You're not very good for our economy. Could, could you find another place to do this weird stuff? The people feared Jesus. The demons feared Jesus. And these people pushed Jesus, pushed Jesus' peace away. There's a woman. She is afraid to come to Jesus. And later on, he's going to say to her, go in peace. And then, of course, there is Jairus, this man whose daughter lies very sick and eventually dies. He's afraid that Jesus was handcuffed by time. He needed to get there quickly to heal his daughter. And then he's afraid Jesus is handcuffed by death because on the way there, Jesus is delayed and the daughter dies. And he's afraid of that. But Jesus, before leaving his house, says, don't be afraid, just believe. You see the themes here. Those are important. When we read scripture, look for themes and commonality because that's especially how the Hebrews, Hebrew writers wrote. 
Also, Jesus shows a definite willingness to risk his reputation in order to fulfill his mission of revealing the Father and securing our salvation, paying our sin debt and earning eternal life for us. He's involved with ceremonial uncleanliness several times. The man of the tombs, this guy possessed by demons, he lived among the dead. The dead were unclean. You couldn't be around a dead body without being deemed unclean and having to go through ceremonial cleansing and you had to stay away from living people. The lady bleeding, she is ceremonially unclean. Certainly a dead girl, again, a dead body, ceremonially unclean. The narrative suggests that only Jesus was close to that demoniac. It tells us that they were together. Apparently, as Jesus and the disciples got off the boat and this demoniac comes running down a hill towards them, the disciples ran back to the boat. And it's just Jesus and this demoniac. He's the one that was touched by the bleeding lady. And he made sure that was publicly known. He's the one that touched the lifeless body of that little girl, which was a societal taboo. All of these occurrences rendered him ceremonially unclean and untouchable according to the norms of society. And yet, he did it. Already we're seeing Jesus is willing to do things that others are not willing to do for us in order to benefit us. This is the Savior we have, and that will only become more pronounced. So with this background, let's dive into our main story for contemplation. What I want to do is take it verse by verse. So I've put it up here on the screen with Stephanie's help here. And here we go. We're, go we're going to go slowly here. We're going to go slowly. This, this isn't jet ski theology today, okay, where we just buzz around Lake Washington on a jet ski and just skim the surface. We're going to stop at times and plumb the depths and go up again and move over and keep doing that. Starting with verse 24, the last part, that's why it says the letter B. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. That word throng means to press together. So you've got to get the video here, okay? You've got the DVD playing in your mind. You're watching this scene as Jesus is walking along and the crowd is pressing. Have you ever been in an audience like that? Have you ever waited outside a stadium and you're about to go in, and, and everybody's touching everybody. They're shoulder to shoulder. That's the way this is. They're pressing together. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Elder Bing last week did the math. If you multiply it by the 360-day Jewish year, you've got 4,320 days that this has gone on. Think of that. Can you imagine her physical condition? Chronically low on blood, low on oxygen, therefore, low on energy, low on color in her face. She's a pale lady here. Can you imagine her emotional condition? Unclean for 12 years, unable to socialize, to touch or be touched. Studies about touching highlight its importance. Some of you may know that Oh, very sad, somewhat grotesque experiment that was done in our nation back in the 40s on 40 newborn children who were divided into two groups equally, 20 children apiece. And one group, well, all 40 of them were taken care of as, as far as feeding, as far as hygiene, all of that was taken care of, clean diapers for everybody, food for everybody. But the first group, the first 20, were not ever held with any type of physical affection or care. Just pure, whatever it took to be sanitary and to be fed, while the other 20 were held very regularly. That terrible experiment was halted after four months. After half of the unnurtured group, 10 out of that 20, died within four months. Terrible experiment. We still have, we still have studies today. You could find them all over the, the web about the significance, the importance of touch. Even now, think of it, with this whole COVID-19 and all the mandates and stuff. Um, we see reported cases of depression, suicide, aggression. They've all risen noticeably. And while the lack of touch is not the only factor, professional doctors consider it one of the factors, of course. Touch is important. This lady's gone without it for 12 years. Verse 26, who had suffered much under many physicians. 
apologies to all the medical professionals out there. This doesn't mean all doctors are flukes, of course. Most doctor-physician interactions seem to be pretty positive. But for this lady, it not only says she saw many physicians, but she suffered under them. We're not told what had been prescribed, but from the phraseology, we know the effects of those prescriptions. She was in greater pain. She was in greater anguish. She only, it only prolonged her illness, the physical and emotional results of her illness. And, and the Bible doesn't use the word suffer lightly the, the way we do over here. You've heard me say this before. We use the word suffer too easily here. I, given my hairstyle, I find it very comical to listen to these commercials on the radio or on television asking me, do you suffer from male pattern baldness? I have it. I'm not suffering. Come on. Really? No, it's not using the word suffer here loosely. What kind of things had she gone through? We don't know for sure, but the Jewish Talmud, which gives us a list of a lot of laws and rituals to be followed by the Jewish people, it's an authoritative source, it gave at least 11 remedies for the malady of, what do we call it, hemophilia? That's the proper name of bleeding profusely. At least 11 remedies. And they included some interesting things. Elder Bing last week mentioned this one, carrying an ostrich age in a certain type of cloth. And that was supposed to help. Here you go, drinking a goblet of wine containing a powder compounded from rubber, alum, and garden crocuses. Mmm, have a glass of that with your Sabbath lunch today. How about a dose of Persian onions cooked in wine to be drunk while... Religious officials are around you bidding the bleeding to flee. And uh, one of my all-time favorites here, you must eat an oak grain that had been extracted from cattle dung. I wonder if on that one she said, you know what, I'll take the bleeding for a little bit, you know, just, I don't know. But she had suffered under many doctors. And... To continue that verse, and she spent all she had. She's financially destitute, not because she went to the equivalent of Vegas, not because she squandered her money, but she was trying to get well. She was trying to spend her money well, and now she's financially destitute. And notice, and was no better, but grew worse. Most of us know that feeling of working very hard and seemingly making little or no progress, right? Right? Talk to my neighbors. I just was talking to Jason across the street yesterday about my lawn. It's become kind of a bit of a focus point for some of my neighbors. I used to have one of the best lawns on the block. I did. And I skipped one year of care. One year of care. I didn't put, I just cut the grass and barely watered it. Didn't do anything at the beginning in spring. Didn't do any winterizing. I just left it. And the following year, man, it just went to pot bald spots all over, brown, all this stuff. So what did I do? I thatched my lawn with one of those beastly machines that makes it look even worse at first, right? It looks like I had 4th of July right there on my lawn, right? And then I had to rake up all the thatched dead grass, pull that up, raking. I hate raking. I don't know about you. I, it's, I Just, wow. Pull my wisdom teeth out again. Just, ah. Oh. Raking, and then what I call dirting. I have to spread soil all over the place, make sure it's packed in, spread a little bit more dirt, and then seed it and fertilize it. And you know what I got out of it? No more new grass. I got more new weeds. You know what it is to work and work hard and make little or no progress. In my case, I went backwards. This poor lady, 12 years she's been seeking a solution. Could you imagine her emotional frustration, as well as the physical fatigue. She had heard reports, verse 27, about Jesus. This is late 29 AD. So it's been two years since Jesus' baptism. There are many reports out there. Jesus has been preaching and teaching for about two years. And by now he's worked, well, the Bible says one, shall I say, group set of miracles where there was a crowd and many people were healed in the crowd. We're not told specifics. But there are, by this point in time, 16 individual miracles that Jesus has performed. 
By this time, this woman reached... So you could imagine the reports, 16 individual miracles that include a leper. Do you think that would be significant to her? Because a leper is certainly considered unclean as she was. And there had been the resurrection of a widow's son. Little aside here, there are about 35 recorded miracles of Jesus in the Bible. 35 individual recorded miracles of Jesus. Nine of them were on the elements, like walking on the water or turning water into wine. The rest of them, 26, per, 26 or 74% of them, were all healings of people. That tell us something about this Jesus. We're focusing on Jesus. Jesus saves all. He, she comes up behind him in the crowd and touches his garment. You notice she doesn't approach him head on. How, first of all, how is she going to get through the crowd that way, going against the grade? That's harder. And what if he sees what she looks like? She's not looking too good right now. What if he knows about her uncleanliness? She's hoping that his healing of the leper is indicative of his willingness. But here she comes. She comes up behind him. Verse 28, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. That hadn't happened yet. That happens after this miracle. There's, there are other miracles where Jesus is just touched and people are healed. But that hadn't happened yet. This is a new thing that she is thinking. Even if I just touch his garments, I will be made well. And the garment probably she would be referring to, many scholars believe, uh, the what we call the zitzit, like that word, zitzit. Those are the little tassels that hang from a Jewish person's prayer shawl. And she may very well have been going for those. I will be made well, made whole, healed. That's translated from this Greek word, sotheomai, sotheomai. Sozo in the Greek is to save. So if we actually translated this more literally, I think healed still fits. That's what she's looking for. But the word, she would be saying, I will be saved. That's what she's saying here. And the idea of being saved is huge in the Bible. Get this from this um, Jewish Christian website. I, they kind of get in our face. So I hope you wore your steel-toed shoes here. This whole word saved. Some, we in our, well, you'll hear what they're saying here. We think of it differently. Let's remember that this was not a light word in the days when Israel was enduring Roman occupation. Here's what the website said. In our modern times, we human beings are so much more safe and secure than our ancestors ever were that we tend to forget that salvation was a primary concern of everybody all the time and had nothing to do with a religion. In biblical times, the quest for salvation was about where to get food from, how to stay safe from the environment or from invaders, how to stay healthy and keep one's children alive, how to keep rulers happy and wild animals at bay. Got the picture? Nowadays, Christianity is mostly forwarded by people who are very secure, and that in turn implies that they have no clue what they're talking about when a wrong choice may mean wholesale destruction of entire villages, people become much more careful about what, they, about what they say they believe and what they put their trust in. Someone who has actually survived some particular ordeal by consciously making the right choices based on sound information is a far better teacher than a sweet-talking thief in a pretty suit. Mm, to be saved. Think of that word. If I just touch his garment, I will be saved. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now here the word heal is just the word heal in the original language. And the disease, interestingly enough, from that word disease, we get, it's also translated sometimes whip or scourge. It's as though this malady has been flogging her. What does that conjure images of, or who, I should say? And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, the Bible says in verse 30, 
Ah, can you think of a superhero who had that tingly sensation about certain things, right? Spider-Man. There's, we just had a new movie in 2019. Now there's another one coming out about him in 2021. There's a little similarity. Again, I, I appreciated how Pastor Seth, during his time here, often correlated these so-called superheroes of the comic books and now the movies with Jesus' life. And you see how we as humanity are looking for a Savior. And we may, there may be some citizens who will shun Jesus, but they'll go to movies and spend boku bucks to see this one and that one and the other one. And there are all these correlations. It's as though we're looking for Jesus without knowing we're looking for Jesus. See, he has this spidey sense. Somehow Jesus' keen awareness of human minds and hearts distinguished between the casual touch of the throng, the crowd, and this intense faith-filled touch of this woman. I once saw a captivating poster. We've all seen captivating posters. This one was a head-on shot. It's as though the photographer had gotten down on one knee and he was just six feet away from this Olympic runner who was kneeling in the starting blocks on the track. Just picture this. So this picture, head-on. This guy's crouched in this low position in the starting blocks. The picture was of this man who's about to run the 100-meter dash. Some of you may be thinking of Usain Bolt. This guy just is amazing, although there's an American not too far behind. So I'm looking at this poster. You could see the sinews of his well-defined arm muscles and leg muscles as he leans forward on these outstretched arms with his fingertips sinking into the, into the lane a little bit. But what most arrested my notice was this super intense and uber-focused look in his sweat-framed eyes. Just looking into those eyes. And then there was the bottom of the poster that said, he has trained the last four years for the next ten seconds. Let that sink in. He has trained the last four years for the next ten seconds. What focus in this woman's touch was this laser-focused belief, all centered on Jesus. This man is centered, this runner is centered on the finish line. This woman is centered on Jesus, laser-focused. And she had nurtured that for a good portion of, of her life there. And Jesus sensed it. Immediately, the verse goes on, Jesus turns about in the crowd and he says, Who touched my garments? Mm. Of course, the disciples get in on this. Seems like a ridiculous question. Verse 31, And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? We would have said the same thing to him. Come on. Who, before that event played out, or the Bible was written, who would have known there was a difference in the way people were touching Jesus that day? Or who would have known there would be different results? Verse 32, and he looked around to see who had done it. And this word look isn't just a casual, you know, peek. This is, this is looking in a very perceptive way. He looked around to see who had done it. Given the incredible insights that Jesus manifests throughout the Gospels, you see him constantly in a group, and then the author tells us, and while Jesus was speaking, these people were thinking, not saying, thinking these thoughts. And then the next line reads, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, right? You've read that. Considering all the times, Jesus shows this incredible um, insight into people's hearts and minds, those around him. It's not hard to believe that he knew who had just faith touched him. Jesus is wanting, so why is he asking? He's wanting this lady to know and to experience something way more than the physical healing. If you and I have something we are really wrestling with, some malady, be it a bad habit, be it some physical ailment, be it some emotional struggle, yes, God wants to heal us, but he wants us to experience more than just freedom from those things. And that's coming up. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling. 
She's not the only one to sense fear and trembling in Jesus' presence before there's the experience of peace. From the original Greek here, the fear and the trembling, that word fear, we get our word phobia from that. The word trembling, we get our word tremors from that. So this is powerful stuff she is going through. Jesus knew that she knew his power, but he wanted her to know his character and his love. Jesus stated that he came to seek and save those who were lost, who were losing out on eternal life through a misperception of God. And he doesn't want this woman walking away without knowing about God. It wasn't just that she had taken the, the plug of her illness and stuck it in the outlet of divine power. No, this is a personal thing. It's the opposite of that very famous Godfather quote, right? It's not personal. It's just business. Jesus wanted her to know this isn't just business. This is deeply, deeply personal. And she fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This is the third person. You've got a demoniac. You've got Jairus who comes and begs Jesus to heal his daughter. And now you've got her bowing at Jesus' feet. And Jesus said to her, oh, this is where the music hikes up. There's a crescendo in the music. What does he call her? Do you see it in the verse there? Daughter. Daughter. When have you heard Jesus say this before in the Bible story? When do you hear him say it after? You don't. Jesus uses a family type name to address someone only twice. Only twice. This usage is amazing because he never used family titles with anyone before. He's not even recorded as addressing Mary as mother. You remember he referred to her as woman, a respectful term, but not mother. Interesting. And yet he calls this woman daughter. I've only found two times where Jesus is addressing somebody by a close family title. Some months before this current story, just a few months before, you remember there was a man let down from a roof who was paralyzed. And Jesus looked at him and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now he's telling this woman, Daughter, your faith. And he goes on, Daughter. He tenderly calls her, this woman, this previously social outcast, of a woman, daughter. Consider that Jesus' most frequent way of terming the God was to use the term father. So what's he saying to her? She's a daughter of who? Right? He's been talking about God as father, 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 and now he says to her, daughter. What's he doing with her mind? He's steering her focus. You have a heavenly father. This isn't just some divine power you plugged into that's non-personal, just an element. You have a personal Father in heaven. Whatever your Father is like, we all have a personal Father in heaven. It's indicative of how the Father himself wanted Jesus to know that. Remember at his baptism, there was a voice. Jesus could hear it. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's important. How many of us to this day may be yearning for some sense of support, love, respect from our parents huge here. Huge. Daughter. You could imagine what did that sound like for him to say it? What, what intonations were in his voice that just oozed and poured forth love to this woman who needed it so much? Not just the physical touch, but now the emotional touch. Your faith has made you well. Literally, your faith has saved you. There's that word again. Jesus wants this woman and everybody around to know how his power flows from himself to human beings through this channel of faith. He leaves no room to think about magic or an impersonal God. And he even gives the praise to God. He doesn't even take the credit himself. He always steers praise to God. And then he says to her, go in peace. Irini in the Greek, which is amazing. We'll get into that. Go in peace and be healed of your disease, the scourge. Notice Jesus saves 
all of her. Not just frees her from the physical malady. And he gives her full healing, mind, body, and spirit. He addresses her as daughter. It, and this word peace, it's attached to the Hebrew word shalom, which means a setting of all things right. When the Jews would greet each other, Shabbat, Sabbath, Shalom. Yes, it's, it's this looking forward to hope, assurance that God is setting all things right and it will ultimately be done. It's that kind of peace. He's, he's expressing wholeness to her, not just physically, but in every way. The woman in our story today was saved from bleeding through Jesus' more profuse bleeding. Don't miss that. She was saved from her bleeding through his more profuse bleeding. I want to go to the next slide. Let's remember that. The Bible tells us that the life of a person is in the blood, so bleeding is a sign, of course, of losing life. How could Jesus pronounce salvation on the woman who was caught in adultery and say there is no condemnation here on you? Because he would take the condemnation for her adultery. How could he free this woman from her bleeding? Because he would take upon himself the bleeding. He would bear everybody's condemnation on the cross. He took all of our guilt before God in his bloodletting experience of the cross as foretold by the prophet Isaiah and now has come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus lived the life. This is not just a cliche. He lived the life that was ours so that we can live the life that is his. That's a true statement. It's not just intellectually giving assent to certain beliefs. So in closing, I want us to go through Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men. Think of how this woman reading Isaiah 53 would have heard these words after meeting Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Could she relate to that? And now she knows he would relate to that. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. All of them. Yet we esteemed him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. And finally verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. Jesus is a complete Savior. Jesus heals. Jesus saves all. All people who come to him. He said, nobody who comes to me will I cast away. Nobody. Whatever your past is, however horrid you think it is, however horrid society thinks it is, however horrid it may actually have been, Jesus accepts those who come to him in sincerity. He saves all. All people can come to him. All imperfections. All imperfections are healed by him. Mentally, he gives us the assurance of God's true character. Emotionally, he gives us his peace and he dispels fears, all fears, even of death. Physically, he heals all diseases, some now, some when he returns, but all will be healed through him. Spiritually, we can be in a right relationship with God right now who transforms us to be like him, to be holy, to be set apart for his use to experience and then share his love. So what are we to do? Look to him daily, through word, through prayer, through some type of ministry that fits your passion and your personality. And thus, what happens? We develop that laser-focused faith of that woman. And we get in touch with a God in such a way that his power flows in us and through us. Let's pray. God, thank you. You are the master storyteller, and you made sure that this book of 66 books would tell us more than anything else who you are. That is the question. The disciples said, who is this who can even speak to the wind and the waves, and they obey him? 
And that's the question of all of us. Who is this? Who is this man? May you continue to reveal to us new facets of your character. And may we just... May we have not just a head knowledge of you, Lord, but give us an experience with you. You're calling people today to do something different. More time with you. Get involved in a ministry, whatever it may be. I know you're calling people today, Lord, to do these things that you empower us to do so we could be closer to you and experience more and more of all you have to give. We thank you for being the one who saves us all from all that is outside your will. We thank you for saving us to your side and to the experience of your blessings now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.